phantom invaders for space, your keys to new year magic, adventure, discovery, the greatest 50 years in the history of mankind. But how do we package all into a show? Spark your magic screen. I have. But when it's blank up here, it's blank up. The magic screen. Boing. Maybe it isn't so blank up here. Come on, magic screen. Come up with something. Here we are back in mystery land, ladies and gentlemen, and man, oh man, have we got excitement. Great night, great night. Everybody's got a detective story, Candidate Agatha Christie, Earl Stanley Gardner, Dorothy Sayers. Everybody's got a candidate as the crowd mills around the famous Academy of Detection Arts and Sciences. And no wonder, being voted on tonight is the award, the Edgar it's called, for the best detective story of the first half of the 20th century. Best detective story. Uh, Ed, any word from the judges yet? Take it away, Ed. You can just barely see the judges. Boy, are they sweating. There they are. This is an absolute bore. He's right. Ah, mystery ish mystery. On the first page, I know who did it. <laughs> who, who done it? Ah, you all recognize the chairman, Edgar Allan Poe, whose murders in the Rue Morgue won the first Edgar. Never more, never more. To his right, Charles Dickens, who gave us one of the strangest detective stories ever penned, The Unfinished Mystery of Edwin Drood. And on the chairman's left is Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky. And that golden skull you see on the table, that's the winner's prize, the coveted Edgar. Of course. That's it. That's us. Gentlemen. What are you doing? Most honorable judges, we have an entry for you. Another answer. Hey, uh, what's he talking about? The contest is closed. Cl well, how can it be when we've got the greatest detective story of the last 50 years? The strange case of the cosmic rays. Cosmic rays. Strange case of the cosmic hmm. rays. An excellent title. You realize, of course, the detective story has certain requirements. Analysis, deduction, seemingly uh, insignificant clues. Right. Well, our story begins with a clue so insignificant, Mr. Poe, it wasn't even noticed for a hundred years or more. The detective story is literature. It must have scope. <laughs> scope, he says. Jim, roll three. Why, the cosmic ray case has helped to revolutionize the modern world. Look, have a look. Atomic power plants for the future. Atomic subs. Atomic planes. Radioactive drugstores. Isotopes for medicine. And hold on to your hats. Well, gentlemen, do we qualify? Theodore? Yet. Science is for me a big bore. A big bore? Why? Do you realize that just while you were speaking, the criminal in our case fired 20 atomic bullets through your head? Good. Holes in the head I like. And you traced this criminal through that tiny clue you spoke of? Yes. The story begins as an ordinary theft. Theft from this simple electroscope, a common instrument that's been in use to detect radiation for generations. It's just an airtight jar with an insulated metal rod from one end of which hang two pieces of gold leaf. Now, normally, they hang straight down. Thank you, boy. But as every school kid knows, when an electric charge is put on the rod, so the leaves become charged. Now, as to the detection powers of the electroscope, when radiation is from this piece of uranium, for instance, enters the jar, the air inside is broken up into charged fragments, some of which neutralize the charge on the leaves and cause them to fall. And the stronger the radiation, the faster they fall. Ah, uh, what is this, a schoolroom? Where is the mystery? Well, the mystery is that when a charged electroscope was put aside, when no known radiation was around, the gold leaves mysteriously lost their charge and collapsed anyway. The tiny clue. So, is leaking a little electricity. That's a bank robbery? That's just how science thought of it. Bank robbery. Roll four. Now, imagine the charged electroscope as a kind of bank and the known radiations as thieves, bank robbers. Yeah, there you are. 
depositors putting their hard-earned electrons into savings accounts. Wait a minute. That's no depositor there. That's Miss Ultraviolet Ray. She's one of the slyest of our robbers. The electrons right off your back. Drop off and have a joke sometime. Don't you do it. There's a distant cousin of Violet's over there, Gamma Ray. Ordinary walls don't mean a thing to him. <laughs> wow, here comes a real tough bunch in from the hideout. The Uranium Gang. Those hombres have been in and out of the calaboose so often they go by numbers. 234, 235, and 238. I hope 235's not carrying what I think he is. You know, those boys are the atom bomb boys. Rebuild the bank, put lead walls around it, nine feet thick. So with nine feet around it, the Electroscope Bank became the Fort Knox of science. Not one of our robbers was sly enough like Ultraviolet. Hey, thank you. Or persistent enough like Gold Gamma. Uh, thank you are powerful enough, like the numbers boys, to break in. <laughs> no more breaking into my bank! Help! Hey, wait a minute. What's wrong now? Mr. President, another robbery! <laughs> Somebody has broken in. Uh, must be a phantom bandit. A phantom bandit? Get the town marshal, get the army, the navy, call out the marines. He must be caught. <laughs> that is literature? Uh, well, it's... The point I'm trying to make, gentlemen, is that just a few inches of lead would shield any electroscope from all known radiations, even from the most powerful X-rays. But this new radiation, why even walls nine feet thick couldn't keep it from crashing through and collapsing the leaves. That meant that some unknown, super-powerful, ghostly radiation was loose in the world. Where did this phantom come from? The first guess was that it came from some new radioactive element in the Earth. But how to prove this? A Jesuit physicist, Theodore Wolf, he had a way. The farther Wolf reasoned, if the phantom radiation came from the Earth, the higher you got in the air, the weaker it would be, and the slower it would discharge the leaves of an electroscope. In 1910, the good father went to the foot of the Eiffel Tower. He charged his electroscope, and then carefully measured how long it took the unknown radiation to steal the charge from the leaves. And then he climbed and climbed and climbed, and at the top, a thousand feet above the Earth, he recharged his electroscope. Now, if the unknown radiation came from the Earth, his electroscope should have discharged more field, the magnetic field, can bend the path of charged particles that move through it, but not of neutral particles. For instance, a neutral particle from outer space is the salt, the track. Now this neutral, having no charge, will shoot through to the Earth's atmosphere in a straight line, as if there were no magnetic field at all. So, if the space pagans neutral particles, they'd be unaffected by the magnetic field, and they'd crash into our atmospheric ocean equally all around the globe. And since each pagan would create the same average number of henchmen, the resulting henchmen would rain down evenly over the whole Earth below. Ah, yes. You see, if Fagin were neutral, the henchmen would rain down evenly over the whole Earth. Eh. Charles, please. I have ears. I can hear. Oh, I beg your pardon. Now, uh, let's see what happens if Fagin is charged. Ah, yes. Let's see what happens if Fagin is charged, yes. If the incoming were charged, 
Now let's let these little red balls and red tubes represent the charged particles in their paths. If the particles coming in from outer space are charged particles, their paths would be bent by the field, as you can see by these few examples here. And the degree of bending is greatest where the particles come in at right angles to the lines of force, as they do here about the equator. As a result, and this is a point, many of the particles coming in near the equator would have their paths bent so much that they'd miss the shell of the atmosphere completely. Look at this, for instance, coming in at this angle, being so strongly, radically bent that it's gone out and hasn't come at all near our Earth's atmosphere. So too this one coming in this direction and steaming out here again without ever getting near the atmosphere. While at the poles, charged particles would be bent very little, if at all, because they come in parallel to the lines of Look at these, how straight the paths are compared to the curved paths of those near the equator. So, if the Fagans were charged, more of them would smash into our atmosphere at the poles than at the equator, kicking more henchmen into action beneath them at the poles than at the equator. And this so-called latitude effect could be measured by counting the number of collision pieces that rain down on us at various latitudes at the bottom of our air ocean. Lights, please. Ah, the more henchmen below, the more Fagans above. Excellent reasoning. The reasoning was simple compared to the legwork.